from section 5.1, we're going to be talking about angles and radian measures, okay, uh, plus other components uh, such as coterminal angles, angles in standard position. Um, then we're going to be talking about uh, uh, application problems uh, dealing with linear speed, angular speed, and so forth. Now, uh, the first thing is the definition of an angle. Okay, it tells you right here that an angle is formed by two rays that have a common endpoint. This is the definition of an angle. Now, what does it mean by uh, two rays? Two rays means like two half, uh, basically, we can say half arrows. So you see that one of, you know, two rays that meet at an endpoint. So this is one ray. From this endpoint that we call B, to this endpoint A with an arrow that extends indefinitely in this direction. That's what we call ray BA or ray AB. Well, in this case, we would say B in the direction of A. Right. Now, we also have another ray, and that will be BC in the direction of C, of course, as you can see. So this are, these are the two rays. And these two rays that meet at an endpoint create what we call an angle. And that angle, it is the opening that is formed between the two rays. So that's the definition of an angle. Okay. Now there's many different ways to name an angle. We can use it by uh, we can name it by a uh, uh, theta symbol, one of those Greek symbols that we use, uh, you know, for to measure angles: beta, theta, uh, gamma. Okay. And we can also name it by the vertices. We can say angle B, which is the vertex of the angle, or we can name it by the three vertices that, is, that form that angle, which may be angle ABC or angle CDA. So there's many different ways to name the angle. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look to uh, basically what does it mean by an angle being in standard position. <coughs> now, an angle is in standard position if its vertex starts at the origin and its initial side is along the positive x-axis. So if we have an x-y-axis, namely right here, and we create an angle that starts from the x-axis, and the opening goes from here to either the positive side, uh, you know, uh, uh, counterclockwise, or uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, whichever one. So then, if it starts from the, uh, as long as it starts from from the from the origin and its initial side, this one we call it the initial side. It is along the positive side of the x-axis. Then that means that the angle is in standard position. Now the other side that creates the angle, the other ray, it's going to be called the terminal side, where the angle ends. So for example, if I say that the angle starts right here on the x-axis, but then it goes all the way to here, then this side where it ends is called the terminal side. And the angle is formed from the x-axis all the way to the terminal side. Right here we're going to call this angle, let's say, theta. <coughs> That angle that you see right here is what we call in standard position. Now, these are just examples of angles in standard position, a positive angle and a negative angle. A positive angle is formed if the angle uh, open, goes counterclockwise from the x-axis, and an, a negative angle will be an angle that is formed if we go clockwise starting from the x-axis. <coughs> now. Um, these are just some definitions of angles that we need to keep in mind. An acute angle is an angle that measures less than 90 degrees, but greater than zero, of course. A right angle is an angle that measures 90 degrees exactly. An obtuse angle is an angle that measures more than 90 degrees, but also less than 180 degrees, so between 90 and 180. Okay? And a straight angle is an angle that measures 180 degrees exactly. <coughs> and we're going to talk about this in terms of rotations afterwards. Okay. So now we're going to look at the definition of a radian. Now one radian is the measure of the central angle of a circle that intercepts an arc equal to, to in length to the radius of the circle. 
So uh, we're going to take a look to that. So there's a little formula to get the radian measure. The radian measure can be obtained by dividing the length of the intercepted arc divided by the length of, its, of the radius. So let's look at some pictures right here to know more about what the radian measure is going to look like. So if I have, for example, a, a circle and um, an angle inside of a circle and that angle uh, you know, that is formed right here first of all from the center to the, to the end point of the circle it has a radius r okay? and now what you can see here is that this angle if we put this radius r along the edges which is called the interest we call this the intercepted arc now it, it takes about two of these measures to fill in the whole angle on the outside, the whole arc that makes that angle. So you can say right here, according to the definition, that this angle beta right here is going to be uh, two radiuses, because that's what you have on the intercepted arc, divided by the radius, which is r, and that gives you two as a measure. So it is two what we call radians. Okay. It's a different measurement from degrees. So it's, it's just another measure of representing an angle. Now, what about this one? On this one, you can see that it takes about three radiuses to make up this angle right here. <coughs> so we're going to say that the measure of the intercepted arc is going to be 3R, three radiuses. And then divided by the radius, which is R, gives us a measure of three radians. So, and this is going to bring a definition that I want you to keep in mind. If we extend this angle a little bit more right here so that it hits this line right here, what type of angle do we form right here from here all the way to this red line? We form what is called a straight angle. And a straight angle measures 180 degrees. Right. So this brings a definition that I want you to keep in mind that um, the measure, you see that this one is about three radiuses. So to get to this point, which is a 180 degrees, we need three and a portion and a little fraction of a radian. So three point some radians. And that is exactly what the number pi is going to be. So that tells us that 180 degrees, it is equivalent to uh, pi radians. Pi, we know what pi is, which is 3.1415 and so on. This is going to be the measurement of the degrees into radians. Okay, so 180 degrees is equivalent to pi radians. <coughs> <coughs> now, so this is the formula to find the measurement of an angle. The measurement of an angle in radians can be obtained by dividing the measurement of the intercepted arc divided by the radius, and that gives us the angle in radian measure. Let's go ahead and answer this question. So we have a central angle theta in a circle of radius 6 inches intercepts an arc of length of 15 inches. What is the radian measure? Theta. So theta is equal to, remember the formula, it says that the length of intercepted arc divided by the radius. So the length of the intercepted arc will be 15 inches divided by the radius, which is going to be 6 inches. Now we can leave it in fraction form or we can estimate it. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to leave it in fraction form, uh, but I'm just going to simplify this fraction. So you see that inches and inches disappears. So that's when our radiance is going to bring, uh, come into play. So the measurement is going to be radiance. 15 divided by 6, that can be simplified. Uh, we can divide them by 3, and we're going to get 5 halves. So that means that this circle that has a radius of 6, and the, and the intercepted arc that forms that angle theta, is, if it is 15 inches, then that means that that angle is going to measure 5 half radians, which is going to be about, we can say 5 halves radians. It is exactly the same thing as 2.5 radians. Right. <coughs> 
Now, remember what I mentioned previously right here, that 180 degrees, based on what we saw on the circle, is equivalent to pi radians, 3 and a piece of a radian, right, which is pi. Then this is the definition here. Since uh, pi radians is equal to 180 degrees, then we can always convert from degrees to radians or from radius to degrees by doing the following. To convert from degrees to radians, all we have to do is we need to multiply the degrees by pi divided by 180. Okay, now to convert from radians to degrees, what we have to do is multiply the angle that you have in radians multiplied by 180 divided by pi radians. And that's the conversion factor that we need to use to convert either from degrees to radians or radians to degrees. Now, let's go ahead and answer the following question. Convert each angle in radians, in degrees to radians. <coughs> we got 30 degrees. Now, to convert this the 30 degrees into radians, all we have to do is we need to multiply it times pi radians. over 180 degrees. And you see that since we have, this is the reason why, because since we have degrees on the numerator and the denominator, the degrees is going to disappear. Right? And that is going to leave us with uh, 30 times pi would be 30 pi divided by 180 radians. This is what we're going to get. But we can simplify this angle. 30 over 180, we can divide 30 and 180 by 30, so we can reduce this fraction. And if we divide them by 30, that's going to give us 1 pi, which is just pi over 6 radians. You can say pi over 6 radians or 1 sixth pi radians. 1 sixth of pi radians. So that would be the measurement 30 degrees. Now, second measurement. Now we're going to convert 90 degrees into radians. So once again, we're going to multiply by pi radians over 180 degrees. Once again, the degrees and the degrees will disappear from this uh, problem, and we're going to end up with 90 times pi, which is 90 pi, divided by 180 radians. But, once again, 90 and 180, we can reduce them. We can divide them both by 90 to simplify this fraction. And this is going to give us 1 pi, which is just pi, over 2 radians. Or, pi over 2 radians is the same thing as 1 half of pi radians. This is the measurement of that the angle in radian form. One half pi radians, or pi over two radians. And the last one. Now for the last angle, we have negative 135 degrees. We're going to convert it into radians. So once again, we need to multiply times pi radians, which is a conversion factor, pi radians divided by 180 degrees. So once again, you see that the degrees uh, simplify, they disappear. So those units disappear, and we end up with one, negative 135 times pi. It's going to be negative 135 pi over 180 radians. And by what can we simplify 135 and 180? I believe we can divide them both by 45, if I am correct. So if we divide them by 45, we are going to end up with <coughs> negative 135 divided by 45 is negative 3 pi over 180 divided by 45 is going to be 4 negative 3 pi over 4 radians, which is exactly the same thing as negative 3 fourths of pi radians.
and that is my measurement of negative 135 degrees into radian measure. <coughs> now let's do, the, uh, let's do it the other way around. Now we're going to convert each angle in radians to degrees. We have pi over 3 radians. Now to convert it from radians to degrees, we're going to do the opposite. Okay. So this is my angle measurement. Pi over 3 radians. We need to multiply this by 180 degrees divided by pi radians. And you see that right here, the radians on the numerator and denominator will simplify. So that's exactly what that's going to leave us. It's going to leave us with degrees. That's the only thing we have left. So we have um, not only that, but, well, I'm just going to multiply first. When you multiply two fractions, 180 times pi, it's going to be 180 pi degrees divided by 3 times pi, which is 3 pi. And what can we see is that the pi can be divided out and we're going to end up with 180 divided by 3, but then 180 degrees divided by 3, it can be simplified. We can, uh, well, we can divide it actually. 180 divided by 3, it's going to give us 60 degrees. So that means that pi, or pi thirds radians or one third pi radians is equivalent to 60 degrees. Next one. <coughs> Let's do the same thing here. Now for the next angle, we're going to have negative 5 pi over 3 radians. So we're going to multiply times 180 degrees divided by pi radians, which is my conversion factor. So once again, what happens in this problem is that the radians divide out, they simplify, and we can also say that the pi's are going to simplify because right here we're going to end up with negative 5 um, pi times 180. It's going to be negative 900 pi degrees divided by 3. And if I divide negative 900 divided by 3, it's going to be negative 300. Oh, I forgot one thing here. We got the pi. The pi also divides out right on the denominator. So we, also, we only end up with negative 900 divided by 3, which is negative 300 degrees. That is the same as negative pi, 5 pi thirds radians, negative 300 degrees. <coughs> the next one. Now we're going to convert one radian into degrees. No pi is involved, just one radian. So in order for me to convert it back to degrees, I need to multiply this by 180 degrees divided by pi radians. So once again, what's going to happen is that the radians are going to divide out. So we're going to end up with 1 times 180, which is going to be 180 degrees over. And right here, the only thing we have is pi radians. <coughs> well, in this case, the radians are already canceled. So all we got to do to find the answer for this one back in uh, degree form, we have to divide the 180 by pi. So I'm going to open up a calculator so we can make that calculation. Now we can also leave the answer like that if, if we, want, we want an exact answer because uh, the next one is just going to be an estimate what we're going to get. <coughs> so we can say that it is going to be 180 over pi degrees. Or it would be best, again, like I said, if we just divide it out. 180 divided by pi, it's going to give us 57 point, uh, like about 57.3 degrees. So let's round to the nearest degree. So this is approximately 57 degrees. <coughs> now, the next concept we're going to talk about is revolutions. Okay, now what is a revolution? A revolution is like uh, basically uh, when a tire, for example, gives one complete lap 
from you know from, from when when you roll a tire you know basically a revolution means uh, you know the distance that it's going to cover around its circumference so the whole distance so how you know th when the tire basically covers the distance from a specific point you know when it rolls all the way until it gets to it to that initial point again so that is one rotation we call it one rotation or one revolution now something that we should know already you know by definition is that one revolution which is one complete rotation of a circle it is equivalent to two pi radians because what what we discussed previously is that half right here which is a, a straight angle equals to 180 degrees so we double that the whole circle is 360 okay so 360 degrees is equivalent to 2 pi radians so that is the equivalence of one full revolution one revolution is equal to 360 degrees okay remember uh, <clears throat> now let's go to the next one the next one says what about this angle? This is not even a revolution because if I go from this initial side all the way to this terminal side, then this angle it is basically less than one revolution because one revolution is when it when you know from where it starts all the way to where it ends on the same point. That is a one complete revolution. So this is going to be a portion of a revolution. Now to find out how much is it is it is going to be, all we have to do is this we already know that one uh, this is radians we already know that one revolution equals to two pi radians right so this is going to be three pi over two radians all we have to do is we need to multiply this angle by the conversion one revolution equals to two pi radians which is basically the same thing as saying I am dividing by 2 pi radians or I am multiplying to, to convert radians into revolutions I am multiplying it by 1 over 2 pi radians and the reason that we do this conversion is that because we want to get the radians out of the way we want to turn it back into revolutions you see that the radians right here they simplify and not only that also the pi's but I'm just going to write what we have 3 pi times 1 it's going to be 3 pi over 2 times 2 pi it's going to be 4 pi and that is revolutions okay so then if we divide out the pi's right here we're going to end up with we're going to find out that this angle that is 3 pi half radians it is equivalent to 3 fourths of a revolution so I'm just going to put it exactly just in, in the words that it should be said of a revolution because it's not even a revolution it's it's less than a re revolution right so it's three-fourths of a revolution three-fourths of one lap around the circle so you see this is one-fourth two-fourths and three-fourths of the whole circle okay and that's what it tells us on the definition up here three-fourths revolutions okay now let's go ahead and take a look to the second one now the second one you see is pi radians that's the angle so that one I think that's the simplest one to determine because this is half of the circle so we know that that one has to be half of one revolution but again if you want to find the you know the com you want to convert it yourself you can always do this multiply the, the the angle in degrees by one revolution which is a conversion factor divided by two pi radians because one revolution is equivalent to two pi radians and once again what we can see is that the radians divide out so we end up with pi times 1 which is 1 pi or we can just say pi divided by 2 pi revolution so then the pi divide out so on the numerator we end up with a 1 so that leaves us with 1 half of a revolution and that's what it tells us on the definition at the top half of a circle is equivalent to one half of a revolution <clears throat> now let's go ahead and take a look to the last one the last one right here is 
pi over 2 radians. You can see that this one is one-fourth of the whole circle. So that means this is equivalent to one-fourth of a revolution. Now, to obtain that conversion of pi over 2 radians into revolution, all we got to do is multiply times the conversion factor, which is 1 times 1 revolution, over its equivalence, which is 2 pi radians. The radians divide out, so my conversion ends up by, as pi times 1, which is pi, over 2 times 2 pi, which is going to be 4 pi, and that is going to be revolutions. And then you can see that the pi divide out, so you're going to be left with 1 over 4, which is the same as 1 fourth of a revolution. So that angle, pi over 2, as we have discussed already, it is only 1 fourth of the whole circle, which means 1 fourth of a complete lap around the circle. Now, I'm going to give you a table with all the different revolutions right here that you need to keep in mind. Um, these are the different types of revolutions of the angles right here. So if I go for, for example, 1 12th of a revolution, that is equal to pi over 6 radians. 1 8th of a revolution equals to pi over 4 radians. And you already know how you can make that conversion. Now, from, re from, from radians to revolutions, we divided it by 2 pi. From revolutions to radians, we multiplied by 2 pi. That's what they're doing right here. Okay? And these are all the different revolutions in terms of radians or radians in, in terms of revo revolutions. Okay? And then in terms of degrees as well, of course. Let's go ahead and answer this question. We need to draw and label each angle in standard position. <coughs> Now, if you are unsure of how much of a revolution that angle is, uh, you can always, um, you know, make the conversion factor. Okay? So for letter A, we kind of already did the conversion factor. So that angle, pi over 4, if we want to turn it back into revolutions, all we have to do is we need to multiply by 1 divided by 2 pi. One revolution equals to two pi radians. And the radians, I don't need them anymore. Remember that the radians will divide out. So then we're going to be left with this. The pi's are going to divide out, and we're going to be left with one over a revolutions. So basically, pi over four is one eighth of a revolution. So we want to draw this angle more accurately. We, without using a protractor, then what we have to do is this. We can divide the plane into eight equivalent pieces. That's what I am going to do. I'm going to divide out the plane into eight equivalent pieces because this is in terms of eight, right? So I'm just going to put it with a dashed line right here. So, And I'm just going to say that right here, this is already into 4, so if I want to put it back into 8, I need to divide it into 4 more. So I'm going to do this division right here, equivalently, okay, equally, and also one division right here, also equally. Okay, approximately. So now it's divided into 8, as you can see. And you, we said that 1 eighth, so this is 1 eighth, this up from here to here is 1 eighth, then up to here is 2 eighths, 3 eighths, 4 eighths, 5 eighths, 6 eighths, 7 eighths, and 8 eighths. And we already said that this, this uh, pi over 4 radians is equivalent to 1 eighth of a revolution. So all we have to do, starting from the initial side, which is the x-axis, all the way to 1 eighth, which is this side right here, that is going to be my angle. Uh, pi over 4. From here to here, it is pi over 4 radians, which it is, like I said, 1 eighth of a revolution. So I'm not going to write it again. I'm just going to point out to it. This is exactly 1 eighth of a revolution. Then 2 eighths, 3 eighths, 4 eighths, 5 eighths, 6 eighths, 7 eighths, and 8 eighths, which is one complete revolution. Okay. Now, let's answer the following question. <coughs> 
Now we're going to answer letter B. For letter B, we want to convert that angle into uh, that angle alpha into uh, revolution. So that's pi pi, pi pi over four. So if we want to convert it, then all we got to do is multiply by one over two pi, or divided by two pi, which is the same thing. And remember that the pi's are going to divide out right here, the pi and the pi. So that's going to leave us with the angle equals to 5 over 8 of a revolution. 5 8 of a revolution. So that's, how, that's what we need to do to actually draw this angle. We need to first of all divide it into 8 and we're going to count 5 8 of a revolution for that angle sta starting from the standard position which is my x-axis. I'm going to make that angle right here. and we're going to divide it into 8 as I spoke. I'm going to make it in dashed lines right here. So I'm going to divide it into fourths right here and I'm going to divide it into a couple of more fourths right here. So, you know that every little uh, every little piece is going to be 1 eighth of a revolution. This is 1 eighth, 2 eighths, 3 eighths, 4 eighths, 5 eighths, 6 eighths, 7, 8, and 8, 8, right? So that angle that we want to measure, which is 5, pi, 5 8 of a, re of a revolution, starting from the standard position, which is the x-axis, then we're going to be counting the 8. So this is 1, 8, 2, 8, 3, 8, 4, 8, and 5, 8, up to here of a revolution, this is where the terminal side of that angle will actually be, on the 5 8, which is located right at this position, at this line. So that angle right here is going to be my pi, a 5 pi over 4 radius. Now, let's answer the next question. Okay, next question is letter C. Letter C tells me now we're going to find this angle beta. This angle beta is negative 3 pi over 4 radians. So if we want to convert it to, uh, uh, to revolutions, we multiply by 1 divided by 2 pi radians. Right? So the radians uh, divide out also the pi's. And that leaves us with that angle beta being negative 3 times 1, which is negative 3 over 4 times 2, which is 8. So negative 3 eighths of a revolution. That's what this angle is going to be. Negative 3 eighths of a revolution. So how do we draw this angle? In the exact same manner. So first of all, we're going to draw the x and the y axis, and we're going to divide it into 8, because that's basically what this one is. It's, it's, it's in 8. So I'm going to add two more lines there so we can put it back into 8. So I'm going to divide these uh, four pieces into eight pieces instead. So every little piece is going to be one eighth of a revolution. So starting from the standard position, which is from the initial side of the x-axis and the origin, which is here, then we're going to count the eight until we hit negative 3 eighths. Now keep in mind that since this, this angle is negative, then it's going to go counterclockwise from the stand, from the initial side. So right here from the initial side is going to go this way. 1 eighth, 2 eighths, and 3 eighths. So all the way down here that's going to be negative 3 eighths of our revolution. So we're going to put the terminal side right in there. So the terminal side is going to be at this location. So this angle that is formed right here is going to be my angle negative 3 pi over 4 radians. We're going to create the last angle that is here on these examples, letter D. Now for letter D, you can see that we got um, the gamma. So angle gamma, we're going to call it gamma, equals to 
to 9 pi over 4 radians. So we want to convert it to revolutions. We need to multiply this angle by 1 over 2 pi because 1 revolution equals to 2 pi radians. So once again, the radians, we know they divide out. I don't have to put them again, and also the pi. So that's going to tell us that the angle gamma equals to 9 times 1, which is 9, over 4 times 2, which is 8 revolution. This one is a little bit more than 1 revolution because you see it's 9 over 8. So this is 1 and 1 eighth over revolution. That's exactly what 9 eighth is going to be. Okay, let's go ahead and draw this last angle. First of all, since it is in eighth, we need to divide it, uh, divide the whole plane equivalently into eight. So if we divide it back into eight, we're back on the same boat. So we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to, we're already into four, so we're going to divide those fours into half, so we can put it into eight now. Okay. And every little piece is one eighth of a revolution. Remember that the in this this angle in standard position has to have uh, must have its initial side on the positive side of the x axis, which is right here. <coughs> and then we're going to start opening the angle from here. So it's nine eighths. That's what we're trying to hit. This is one eighth, two eighths, three eighths, four eighths. 5 eighths, 6 eighths, 7 eighths, 8 eighths, and it is a little bit more than one revolution, so it's going to end up right here at 9 eighths. So that's where the angle is going to land. And as you can notice, isn't that angle basically equivalent to an angle of 1 eighth of a revolution? Yeah, it is. So that's something we're going to talk about in a little bit, which is called coterminal angles. Now, uh, I show you all the different types of angles right here, so I want you to get familiar with all the, the angles, the special angles. So a 30 degree angle is pi over 6 radians, 45 degree angle if you convert it to radians is pi over 4 radians, 60 degree angle is pi over 3 radians, okay, so which is the same as the, the double of 30, right? So if I double this one, this is 2 pi over 6, but 2 pi over 6 is the same as pi over 3. Then a 90 degree angle is pi over 2 radians, then and so on. So these are all the different angles, uh, special types of angles. And of course, like I mentioned to you, those angles in terms of revolutions. A 30 degree angle, if I divide it by 2 pi, it is going to give me basically 1 twelfth of a revolution. So it is uh, a 30 degree angle is one twelfth of a revolution. A 45 degree angle is one eighth of a revolution. A 60 degree angle is one sixth of a revolution. 90 degree angle is one fourth of a whole revolution, and so on and so on and so on. Okay. Now I, I mentioned the word coterminal just a little while ago. This is basically what I want you to focus now. So if I increase an angle any given angle in standard position and I increase it by a multiple of 360 degrees which is 2 pi degrees, 2 pi degrees means one complete rotation afterwards, then that is going to create the same angle as the angle if I didn't do that, ro that rotation. That's exactly what happened with this last angle that we talked about. This last angle, what happens if I, w if I would have just said, okay, my angle is one eighth of a revolution which is the same as pi over 4 radians. If I increase it by 360, that means that I'm from here, I'm going to do one complete rotation again, and it's going to go back to the same point. That doesn't change the angle. It just, uh, I mean, it changes the actual physical measure of the angle, but in reality, when sketched, that angle is going to have the same angle in standard position. If you look at that opening, that opening is basically still the same. It creates the same angle as if it was a one-eighth of a revolution. It creates a 45-degree angle.
So that's basically what coterminal angles are going to be. If I increase or decrease any measure of an angle in standard position by an integer of 300 by a, mu by a multiple of 360 or 2 pi, those, those are the equivalences in degrees or radians then that is going to create a coterminal co angle, which is an angle that is the same as that angle. If we sketch it, it just has a, dif it just has a different value, but it is the same angle when sketched. Okay. So, on the following problem, what we want to do is, we want to assume that these angles are in standard position. We want to find an angle that is smaller than 360, that is Co-terminal, a positive angle. Positive angle less than 360 means any angle between zero degrees and 360 degrees. Not doing any rotation before we get to one rotation. So we want to find the smallest possible angle that is positive, so that that is co-terminal to 420 degrees. So to find a co-terminal angle that is the same as 420, all we have to do, we have to subtract it by 360 until the angle gives us an angle less than 360. So if I subtract 360 from this 420 degree angle, that is going to give us a 60 degree angle. So if I sketch the 60 degree angle and if I sketch the 420 degree angle, they will actually give me the same angle in standard position. Okay. So that, that 60 degree angle, it's coterminal to 420. Okay. Now, Let's do the same thing for the next one. Now for negative 120, that one is negative, so how do I bring it back to positive? Not subtracting, but by adding my multiple of 360 degrees. So if I add 360 degrees to this angle, that gives me a 240. What does that mean? That this angle 240, when sketched, is going to give me the same angle as negative 120. Now, let's go to the next one. Now we're going to convert these angles. Uh, we we want to find a coterminal angle from these angles in standard position. Also, uh, also I mean, uh, between f f to an angle between 0 and 360, which is between 0 and 2 pi. So 17 pi over 6. That one, we know, we know that 12 pi over 6 is going to be, uh, you know, 2 pi. Right, so that one is basically 17 pi over 6 is more than 2 pi, which is more than 360. So in order for me to make it smaller than 360 or smaller than 2 pi, I need to subtract 2 pi from this angle. Okay, but since these do not have the same denominator, what I have to do, this is over 1, I need to make them into a denominator of 6 by multiplying this fraction by 6 to have, them the, have the same denominator. So that gives us. 17 pi over 6, then that gives us a minus 12 pi over 6, then 17 pi minus 12 pi, it is going to give us a 5 pi over 6 radian. So that means that if I sketch 17 pi over 6, it is going to be the exact same angle as 5 pi over 6 radian. It just has a different measure. But when sketched, they look the same. The terminal side and the initial side will be at the same length. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, the next angle, negative pi over 12 radians. That one is negative, so if I want to make it into a positive angle, <coughs> then on this one, I have to add a 2 pi radius to it. But again, since they don't have the same denominator, I need to put them in the on, the on the same denominator. So I need to multiply this fraction by 12 so I can have them to have the same denominator. So this is going to give us negative pi over 12. Then if I add 24 pi 12, negative pi 12 plus 24 pi 12 is going to give me 23 pi 12. So that angle is going to have the same initial side and the same terminal side as this angle. Okay. Oh, and those are the only two from here. Now, next. This one is a little bit more complex. 
Now, on this one, we might have to do more uh, multiple rotations. Multiple rotations means that we might have to subtract or add 360 or 2 pi a multiple number of times because the angle is still going to be greater than 360 or a negative angle still. So we need to, uh, we might have to do that several times until we make it to be a positive angle between 0 and 360. <coughs> so 750. For that one, if I want to find the possible, the smallest possible angle that is coterminal to that one, and it is less than 360, I have to subtract 360 from it. But if you subtract 360, what is that going to give us? Hold on, I need to connect this. So, then, then that's going to give us 390. But that 390, it is still bigger than um, 360. So what we have to do, we have to subtract 360 again. So if we subtract 360 from 390, that's going to give us a 30. So the smallest possible angle between 0 and 360 that is coterminal to 750 degrees, it is going to be 30 degrees. So if we sketch 30 and 750, they're going to give me the same initial side and the same terminal side for that angle. <coughs> the next one, 22 pi thirds. That one, for sure, it is more than 360, more than 2 pi. So what we need to do to bring it down, we have to subtract 2 pi from it. But we might have to do it multiple times, again, because that angle is really large. If we divide 22 divided by 3, you can see that it is going to be Seven, so seven, uh, like about seven pi or so. So we're gonna have to m subtract the two pi multiple times. But again, if I wanna subtract it, remember that we need to put them under the same denominator. To, to to have it the same denominator, we need to multiply this one by three, so we can have it into thirds. So that's gonna give us a twenty-two pi thirds minus six pi thirds then 22 pi thirds minus 6 pi thirds, that's going to be 16 pi thirds. But that is still bigger than 2 pi. So that angle, we need to subtract it again. 16 pi thirds, I need to subtract it by 2 pi again. But I'm not going to put the 2 pi. We already know that 2 pi in thirds, it is the same thing as 6 pi thirds. So I'm going to subtract 6 pi thirds again, and that gives me 10 pi thirds. Now, but if you divide 10 divided by 3, that is still bigger than 2 pi, which is bigger than 360. So we need to do it again. So 10 pi thirds, if I subtract the 2 pi again, which is the same equivalent to 6 pi thirds, then that is going to give us 4 pi thirds. So then that one is already less than 360, so that means that if I sketch 4 pi third radians and 22 pi third radians, they would have the same initial side and the sa same terminal side. They will, they will look like the same angle. <coughs> Last but not least on this one, negative 17 pi sixth. First of all, I need to make it positive. Make it the smallest possible positive angle that is less than 2 pi that is coterminal to that one. So to make it positive, we need to add multiples of 2 pi. But again, we need to have it have the same denominator. We need to multiply this one by 6 to make it the same denominator. So that's going to be negative 17 pi 6 plus 12 pi 6. Negative 17 plus 12, it is going to give us a negative 5 pi 6. But that is still negative, so we need to add another 2 pi to it again. But remember, 2 pi in terms of 6s, it is going to be the same thing as 12 pi over 6. We already did it here. So if I add the 12 pi over 6 again, that is going to give us a 7 pi over 6. And that's already less than, three, uh, than 360, or less than 2 pi. So 7 pi 6, when sketched, it has to give me the same initial side and the same terminal side, 
as data as this angle right here. Of course, this one is negative, this one is positive, but again, it, uh, the, the, the initial uh, uh, ray and the terminal ray will be on the same position. <coughs> now, next definition that we're going to cover is, remember we talked about how do we find the measurement of an angle in radians. We said that to, in order for us to find an angle in radians, all we have to do, we have to divide the length of the intercepted arc, which we call it S, divided by the radius R. Right. That was a formula that we talked about before. In order for me to find an angle in radians in a circle, I divide the length of the intercepted arc of that circle divided by the radius of that circle. But now, what happens if I want to find the length of an intercepted arc, not the, not the angle? So all I got to do is I need to multiply the radius on both sides of this equation uh, so I can uh, uh, get rid of the radius from this fraction. And that's going to give us that the length of the arc is equal to the length of the radius times the angle in radians. That's basically what this formula tells us. If I now want to find the length of an arc, the length of an arc means uh, the arc on the outside that is formed by any angle theta. Okay, so if I want to find that arc on the outside, all I need to do is multiply the radius of that circle times the angle in radians. Okay, in radians. Now, let's go ahead and take a look to the next problem. A circle has a radius of 10 inches. Find the length of the arc intercepted by the central angle of 120. So the length of the intercepted arc is equal to, I'm just going to put the formula up here, the length of an intercepted arc equals to the radius times the angle, but the angle must be in radian. Okay. So if I want to convert, first of all, what we need to do in this problem is we need to convert this angle of 120 degrees, we need to convert that to radians. So to convert it into radians, all we have to do is remember the conversion factor. We need to multiply this by pi radians, and its conversion is going to be 180 degrees. Pi radians divided by 180 degrees. The degrees are going to disappear, and we're going to end up with an angle of pi equals to 120 times pi is 120 pi divided by 180 radian. So we can simplify this angle. We can divide the 120 and the 180, I believe, by 60. So if we divide them by 60, that is going to give us an angle of 2 pi thirds radian. So that angle in radians, 120 degrees, it is the same as 2 pi thirds radian. So now we're going to find the answer for the length of the arc. The length of the arc can be found by multiplying the radius. The radius, we already have it right here, which is 10 inches, okay, times the length of, uh, times the angle in radian, and that angle in radian is 2 pi thirds. And so you see that my units for this one is going to be inches, okay? So this is going to be in inches. So that's the length of the arc. It's going to be whatever number of inches we find. <coughs> now, if we multiply 10 times 2, that's going to be 20 pi thirds inches. This is the measurement of that arc, 20 pi thirds inches. <coughs> or if we divide it out, we can estimate it using a calculator. We can say 20 and then pi thirds, means divided by 3, equals to approximately 20.94 inches, or 20.9 inches, which is about 21 inches, approximately. This is an estimate for that measurement. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Now we're going to talk about a couple of last formulas in this section, which is going to be the formulas for linear speed and angular speed. Now, <coughs> <coughs> linear speed, as you remember, uh, just, just from physics, to find the velocity of an object uh, traveling, to find the speed of an object, we just have to divide the distance divided by the time. That's the formula for the linear speed. <coughs> so, but in this case, the linear speed, we're talking about uh, an object, like, a, like we're talking about circles in this case, okay? And the circle, basically, uh, the linear speed of the circle, we're going to represent it in terms of the length of its diameter, which is basically its arc length, okay? How much distance has a tire cover with respect to time? It is going to give us a speed in terms of a tire, in terms of a, of a circle, okay? So that we call it the arc length. That's the same thing as the distance of covered by the tire divided by the time, okay? But wait a minute. There's a couple of things that we already mentioned before. We already mentioned before that the, the length of the, of the arc can be found by multiplying the radius times the angle. So this is a modification of that formula. So if I multiply the, uh, of, from any circle the radius times the angle of that circle that it traveled divided by the time with respect to time, then that's going to give us the linear speed at which that circle is traveling with respect to time or that tire or that circle, whatever it is. But now there's another formula that I want you to keep in mind. It is angular speed. It is represented by this symbol. Okay? Angular speed means basically how fast is the angle rotating with respect to time. So basically how many rotations is the angle or how many degrees is the angle changing you know, as the time passes. So every cell, after one second, how many rotations did the tire do? After two seconds, how many rotations or how many degrees did the tire travel? Okay? So remember that one rotation is equivalent to 360 degrees. So in order for me to find the angular speed, it, that is in terms of an angle. So the angle of the tire. How fast is the angle changing? And that will be represented by the angle in radians divided by the time. That is the angular speed. The angular speed is the angle in radians divided by the time. How fast is the angle changing with respect to time? <coughs> but since that represents the angular speed, that we is exactly what we have right here on this other modification of the formula that I gave you. So if I replace that with the angular speed, then another way for finding the linear speed is by multiplying the radius times the angular speed at which the angle is changing, the speed at which the angle is changing. So if I multiply the radius times the speed at which an angle is changing, then that's going to give me the linear speed of that tire or of that car that is traveling. Okay? How fast are the tires of the angle of the tires traveling with respect to time. That's basically what the angular speed is. Okay. So, and that's the second modification that I have right here. So the linear speed can also be found by multiplying the radius times the angular speed, which is how fast the angle is changing with respect to time. Let's look at this problem, and this is the last question we're going to answer. <coughs> A wind machine used to generate electricity, which is this right here, has blades that are 10 feet in length. So these are the blades. And they are rotating the propeller. They're rotating at four revolutions per second. So these propellers are rotating around a circle at four revolutions per second. Okay. So to find, uh, from that revolutions per second, we can actually determine the angular speed. Because the angular speed, we know that every revolution is equal to 2 pi radians. So we can find the angle, you know, how much is the angle, how, you know, how many degrees are being traveled by the blades with respect to time for every second. That's exactly what we're going to find out first. Okay? So we are already given that the blades has a length of 10 feet. 
So that basically, if we talked about it in terms of a circle, that basically represents the radius of the circle. Right? So from here to here, that would be my radius. So we know already that the radius is going to be 10 feet. And we can find the angular speed because we know that the blades are traveling at four revolutions per second. That's how fast they're traveling. Uh, so if we want to find the angle uh, that, that travels every second, then all we got to do, since it is four revolutions per second, that's basically what per second means, then all we got to do to cancel out those, to simplify those revolutions or to make it disappear, I need to put the conversion factor of revolutions to uh, radius. And we know that I have to put revolutions on the bottom because revolutions is at the top and I want it to simplify out, right? So we know that the conversion factor is that one revolution right here equals to two pi radius. So now we can say that the revolutions are going to simplify and my angle, it is going to be in terms of radians per second, which is an angle per second, okay? That's exactly what the angular speed is. So if we multiply this, 4 times 2 pi, it is going to be 8 pi. Divided by 1, it is basically going to be 8 pi radians per second. This is how fast the angle is changing. The angle is changing at a speed of 8 radians per second. So every second, the blades are rotating 8 pi radians, which is 4 revolutions. So now, if I want to find the linear speed of the blade, that is going to be my question. That's what we're going to do. The question was to find the linear speed, the velocity. So the linear speed can be found by multiplying the angle times, uh, I mean the angle, the radius times the angular speed. We already found those pieces of information. The radius, it is going to be 10 feet. And the angular speed, it is going to be 8 pi radians per second. So right here on my linear speed, you're going to have these units. So the radians, you don't actually have to write them down. So right here, it is going to be feet per second. That's what my unit of this conversion is going to be, feet per second. So if I multiply 10 times 8 pi, it is going to be 80 pi. So that means that this blade are rotating at a linear speed, at a speed of 80 pi feet per second. That's how fast they are traveling. If we want to find an estimate, all we have to do is put this in the calculator. So 80 pi, oh, 80 pi, it is going to give us approximately 251.3. So let's round it to the nearest uh, feet, to the nearest foot. So we can say two, it is approximately 251 feet per second. This is the speed at which the blades are traveling. And that's the answer for the question. Just know that depending on the, the units that we need, to, that the question is being asked for you to write, you need, you're going to have to make a several conversions. So, for example, instead of feet per second, what if I would ask you convert this to um, a miles per hour, or miles per minute, or miles per second, or meters per second? Then you need to use conversion factors to change the feet to miles, the feet to meters, or the seconds to hours, the second to minutes. Okay? So there's going to be conversions involved in this section, so make sure you know the conversion factors for each one of the measurements. Okay. So this problem on this word problem on linear and angular speed uh, concludes uh, section 5.1, which is angles and radian measures.